And it's a privilege in many ways to have each of our friends with us today, but especially Professor McIntosh, because he nearly didn't make it through this last year. You may have heard that. He ended up in hospital uh, with a severe heart, heart attack. And thank the Lord, God raised him up. And um, he's with us. In fact, he ended up in the hospital a second time. But God in his mercy saw fit to raise him back up. And he's not finished with him yet. So we're privileged to have him with us today. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mr. McIntosh. To the Oxford Church. Now, because a lot of what I'm doing is visual on the screen, I really go to recommend that the folks sitting there come and join the central seats. And the folks sitting there, Philip and um, the good lady there, and others, Suzanne, if you come over, thank you. You do need to see the screen. Sorry, James, I'm sorry to move you. <laughs> but uh, I think we, we probably, oh, poor Neil, he's there, sat, but he knows what I'm going to say. He'll go to sleep. So, <laughs> and Simon, well. There we go. Um, well, the Lord bless you all. I, I really count it a privilege to be amongst you. I, I, I love the work that's going on here at, uh, at Oxford. I pray for it, and I'm, I'm just uh, bowled over by the faith which is emanating from the leadership here. And it's all glory to God. It's not glory to a person. It's glory to the Lord Jesus, who has placed this vision and without a vision, the people perish. And we all need vision. And we need that, that, that view of God, the greatness of God. And that's what this talk is all about, really. But I just want to mention something which is on your seats first. If you could, can you just pick this up? You've still got time to get your young people involved in the Truth in Science Summer School, which is coming up. It's... Uh, just, uh, what are we, Saturday? So it's just under a week's time. Friday, Saturday. It's not an Answers in Genesis event, but I got special permission from higher authority to mention this. And I actually did. I asked courteously, could I mention it? And uh, I was told I could. So the summer school is on your seat. And if you've got young people particularly, but if you're older, like, you know, 90, 95, you're still welcome because you've got young in spirit. But, you, but uh, frankly, as long you can come, but as long as you, you know, you can take your walking stick with you, but you must realize that the, the event is geared for sixth formers and uh, university students to try and prepare them for the onslaught that they will receive, not just in sciences, but in humanities. And there will be a testimony possibly of a humanities student because the zoology student probably can't do it because uh, there's uh, a health problem in her family. But anyway, there'll be a testimony and there'll be many other uh, workshop sessions trying to prepare people in their various disciplines, like medicine, like geology, all the other disciplines. So just take this and they need to book at www. It doesn't say it up there and I should have put it on www.truthinscience.uk. Just remember Truth in Science, all written together, .uk. That's all you need. But you must have the UK because otherwise you'll be taken to the US version. And uh, hmm, the US version isn't the same. It just so happens that there is one over there. But uh, Derek would disown himself from that. So there we go. But uh, uh, sorry, I got the wrong dates written there because it was going to be in 2020. And uh, it, the, 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 the slip here is right, but it's Friday the 3rd and Saturday the 4th, sorry, uh, and it's just £30, so there you go. Okay, right, I'm going to talk to you about the wonder of the human voice, and this is just designed, you'll see, to give glory to God. And indeed, one of the things that I'm going to be saying is that the voice that God has given you is primarily given to actually glorify God. And God himself, of course, uses his voice. Right there, right in the beginning at creation, what does it say in Genesis 1? Only a few verses down, it says, 
and God said, right? God's voice is very, very important. And we are made in the image of God, Genesis 1 verse 27. So it's hardly surprising that under normal conditions, we know that some people sometimes are not able to speak and we're aware of that. But essentially, we are designed to communicate and God has great glory when he has us praying or singing to his name. Heaven, by the way, is going to be full of sound. It's going to be full of voices praising God. And many people, you know, in other religions, they will have dirges, but they won't have the songs that we have. One of the biggest differences between the Christian faith and all other religions is that there is a rejoicing note in the spirit of Christianity. Now, it is true that you'll find other religions do have songs of a kind, but they're not really the sort of, they're, they're just excelling in the joy of what they know. So it's all because God spoke everything into existence and God had everything speaking, spoken into existence and um, those things immediately came into existence. You'll have to watch both Simon's talk on the theology of creation. I've done a talk on uh, why creation is important, where we explain how there is no other way you can have that being some sort of long period of time. It doesn't make sense. The one who is essentially doing the action is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not three gods. The Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. The Trinity is involved because it says, God, let, God said, let us make man in our image. But So it's not three gods, but the action is through the Spirit of God and through the Word, which of course is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very difficult to actually get at what's going on here because we're not told everything explicitly in Genesis 1. But when you deduce from John chapter 1, without him was not anything made that was made, John 1, 3, the prime mover is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the desire of the Father to elevate the Lord Jesus Christ in creation. Colossians 1 says that, and in re particularly in redemption. So the human voice coming to us were made in his image. We had uh, the presentation or the, the talk earlier, the preaching from uh, Derek, where he was speaking on Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And of course, it's hardly surprising then that man whom he made in his image is also built for communication. The Trinity, coming back to thinking of God, it always communicates. For instance, God the Father is communicating to the Son in Matthew chapter 3. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then you have the Lord Jesus Christ communicating to the Father in prayer in John 17. Of course, most of the mornings, the Lord Jesus Christ was away on his own praying as a superb example of what we should be doing. I struggle, if you're anything like me, you struggle each morning to carve out that precious time but we all need it as Christians to communicate with God and to pray to him and to pour out our hearts to him. I actually happen to have the joy of tuning in to the prayer meeting that took place this morning. Uh, just it was a chance happening. It was an accident, actually. But you'll have to ask me afterwards how it happened. But I heard the imploring of in prayer and how much we need to be praying to the Lord. And, you know, years ago when I was a very, very young uh, person trying to understand how to do mission, I'm involved in beach missions and uh, open air missions, as you probably know. And years ago when I was learning ropes, I had the, had the joy of listening. Just, uh, it was just, again, it was because I was, it was an open door and the leader was praying. And I heard his heart cry. And I thought, this is the secret as to why that man is so blessed in his open air preaching, wonderfully used of God. He's died now, he's with the Lord. 
But prayer is so important. And there is the Lord himself saying, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Psalm 3 says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. He wants to hear your voice. Did you know that as believers? If you're a believer, when did you last really pray and really let out your heart in praise to God? Or maybe you have this particular issue that you have and you needed to pray and bring it before the Lord. We could say more on that. Prayer is so important. The human voice is made for communication. And we're going to consider the other two titles in turn. Every voice is unique. And then I'll end on the wonder of singing. So the human voice is made for communication. It's not, though, just basic needs. If the evolutionist is going to argue with me, he'll say, well, we come from grunting as it says a bit later in one of my slides, grunting to gabbing, you know, that we were grunting like apes in, in the forest and eventually, you know, it led to where we are now. Is that really true? You see, we may grunt sometimes, where's my food? Or, but we actually do also sometimes say, what a beautiful sunset, which is nothing to do with my needs. It's to do with an appreciation of something higher than me. And we might ask the question, why am I here? That's so unique to humans. There is something more than just the everyday things of life. In fact, some of us know full well that we can get too busy, even in the Lord's work, to stand back and appreciate the greatness of creation, and also the greatness of redemption. That's why we need to have those times of reflection, reading the word of God and praying every day. So humans are the only creatures who think abstractly. Thought often then leads to words expressed with the voice. My son's just uh, on his way up to Edinburgh. And uh, on the way, he decided, as you do, oh, we'll go up, uh, we'll go up. Uh, which mountain was it? Scarfell uh, in, in the Lake District. When I got here, it was already at the top. But, uh, you know, he loves going up mountains. And, he, and I've been up some of the smaller ones with him. And I've enjoyed the wonder of the view. And we all sort of say, isn't it marvelous, even in a fallen world, what God has done? But you see, we have this ability to appreciate beauty. Now, others who would think against us would say, well, animals are surely the same because you can teach an animal to do tricks. Well, let me explain. A dog can be trained by reward and punishment to stay when he is told, stay, all right? But just taking that word, he associates the sound stay with a behavior, and he performs that behavior. But if we were to change the context and say, let's stay a bit longer at the beach, he wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Because he is associating just the sounds with an action. He's not understanding the context, the wider context at all. That's from a person called Michael Egnor, who makes some very good points on mind matters. So ideas isn't the same as the issues of, you know, the basic necessities of life. And we need to understand how the voice works, which is itself evidence that we are not evolved from ape-like creatures. So I'm going to dive now into a little bit of the science of acoustics. You might say, how come I am speaking on this subject? Well, I spent a long time in my research actually dealing with what's called pressure waves, uh, which includes acoustic waves, which I'm using now. But big pressure waves, of course, make huge destruction, blast waves, which sometimes you get in terrible explosions like happened a few days ago. Um, and people were very sadly killed out there in Afghanistan. That's a pressure wave which is doing most of the damage. But I'm talking about very, very, very small oscillations of pressure. 
And that's what I've been dealing with for many years. And in my earlier incarnation, I was going to say, but in my earlier work, when I was working at the University of Leeds, I did some work on Rika tubes where you could actually make a sound in a metal tube from a burner. Just watch this for a moment. And we put it over this. And the reason it makes a noise is because that vibration that you can hear of a, the premix flame wanting to get down into the tube then begins to excite what we call pressure waves. Uh, some people call them organ pipe. Okay. So that's just an illustration of the work that I used to do. So I had to understand acoustics. Now, acoustics, of course, that I'm talking about today has nothing to do with flames causing them. It's to do with this larynx, which uh, I'm going to talk briefly about. And then I'm going to show you that there is something equivalent to that metal tube that I just showed you about. We'll come to that. So you've got vocal cords in the larynx. I won't go into all the detail here, but the epiglottis is, uh, is the little bit of um, membrane which will come down on these when you're trying to eat. And uh, you can actually get problems if you try and eat and speak, as some of you may have tried to do. You could choke yourself. But your vocal cords open, are shown there, and the vocal cords closed, actually shows what happens when you're going to actually use them to speak. And it's the vibration of those chords which actually gives you the basic sound, but it's not the only thing that brings the sound. You probably realize that if you whistle, you're not using your larynx. So if I was to whistle, that is nothing to do with the larynx. It's to do with air passing through the lips, which then make a vibration. So you actually have not only the larynx, but you have a whole system here of a voice box which includes the mouth and the throat as well as the lips. And even the teeth are involved as well. And in particular, this thing, the tongue. And the tongue is exceedingly different to that which the evolutionist says that we've evolved it from, which I'm going to actually show you in a moment. So... The, the human vocal apparatus is like two kinds of musical instruments at once. You've got a string instrument here, which is the larynx, the voice box down here. And then you've got all the voice box, and I'm going to highlight something here in a moment, which is going to be exceedingly important. I'll name it in a moment. And we've got the voice box, as I said, the... The, the tongue and the lips and the shape of your mouth and, of course, the ability to actually make sounds with the lips alone. So all this has to be controlled. And Stuart Burgess is going to actually uh, finish off our afternoon with a, a talk which he's going to give on the nerve system. Um, but he's also written, quite rightly, on the muscles compared with this drawing on the left of, a, of, of an ape and the muscle arrangement for the human being. And he quite rightly points out that the number of muscles that an ape has is actually far less, about half, that which we have in the human beings. So we need to also recognize that there is a set of muscles inside the mouth, which are not shown there, which also control the expressions. It's not just the ones on the outside. There is muscles inside which enable us to make different sounds to do with speech and also affect our expression. All these are controlled by nerves, which Professor Burgess will talk about in his last talk. And you really need to get the whole of Oxford listening to that last talk, which is coming on this afternoon. It's absolutely brilliant. It has me spellbound. I've heard it twice, I think, maybe three times. And I'm looking forward to hearing it yet again. It really is an excellent talk. So 
Now we come to the tongue. You remember I said uh, an ape or a chimp, and it's the same for all the simian kind, but they have a tongue which is uh, th this rather thick object here. And uh, uh, granted, it's pretty thick with us as well, but they don't have the movement that we have. They have a very small uh, little opening there. It's not actually very big at all. They cannot change their mouth features in the same way that we can. They don't have the ability to move that tongue other than really just forward and backwards, whereas we can move it up and down. And in particular, we can put it against the teeth, which enables us to give the th sound which uh, many people from other countries struggle with. Uh, but, you know, that sound and all the other sounds that we also have problems with using the tongue or using the throat, like the French, I can't do it. But, you know, that is all to do with the control of this box here, okay? And you tried to get a monkey doing it, you did find it impossible. But what I want you to notice in particular here is this right? We've got the larynx here, but this is essentially acting like that tube that I showed you going over a premix flame, which in this case, of course, were providing the sound from our larynx, right? So that's going, uh, right? And that's vibrating. And it's amplified by this tube, which is actually called the pharynx, okay? So we've got a pharynx as well as a larynx, get that? Now, if you look at the chimp, it doesn't basically have it. It's, it doesn't really have that tube. It cannot, it cannot amplify its sound. It cannot throw. Well, it can throw a banana, but it can't throw its voice. Yet they can call, yes, from the larynx alone, just like you can. You know, you hear the squeaks of monkeys in the trees, but you can't get you can't get a voice calling like that. And I'm using my larynx, and I'm actually using my diaphragm as well. And it's this whole system which is all connected for a human being. This is really hugely important. Now, now we come to what the evolutionist says. This is an evolutionist uh, speaking, Kathleen Masterton. The Human Edge in uh, 2010, she says, the reason the neck started getting longer, this is quoting Dr. Philip Lieberman, so she's talking about this evolutionist and she herself would accept what he says, is that the tongue moved down, pulling the larynx lower, requiring more room for it in all in the neck. The first time we see human skulls, fossils, that have everything is in place, is about 50,000 years ago where the neck is long enough, the mouth is short enough that they could have had a vocal tract like us. Frankly, that is what we call Lamarckianism, like that the giraffe got its long neck because it had to stretch to get more food. Well, that's been dismissed long ago by evolutionists themselves. But then this goes on. Lieberman goes on to say the downside of this was that because you're pulling the larynx all the way down when you eat, all the food has to go past the larynx and miss it and get into the esophagus. Lieberman says that's why people choke to death. <laughs> well, that frankly is just a nonsense. Yes, there have been accidents when people try to speak as well as eat. That's true. And I know of one actually where somebody did die due to choking on food. But that, that frankly is, is the rare, rare exception most of us know that actually it's not a good idea to eat a banana while you're trying to talk to somebody, right? And even, even a monkey actually might understand that. But so we evolved this crazy airway, he goes on to say, that allows us to choke to death more efficiently or to further our ability to make more sounds and speak. Oh, this is frankly just lunacy. This is absurdity because he's saying that, you know, all based on no evidence whatsoever that not even if you were to take the fossil record as a, a track record over time, which I don't believe for a moment it is, all the fossils are primarily due to the flood. 
but you do not see any progression that he's talking about. So he then says it's hard to pinpoint when we move beyond primitive grunts and started talking. You bet it's very hard to pinpoint. You cannot find any bit of hard evidence to show the change from a no pharynx situation to a pharynx situation, which is what I was talking about earlier. So just say a little bit more about the science here. If I'm making you go to sleep, please don't snore. But I just want to give you a little bit, by the way, that's another sound you can make. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's not to do with, well, unless you're talking in your sleep, maybe. But anyway, you've got all sorts of things you can control, the lips, the teeth, the mouth, the throat, the pharynx, okay? Now, that's just, I, I've mentioned there, five, right? Well, just take those five. You can control them, change the way the air goes through. You can also, as you can see on the second picture on the right, you can make them wider, narrower. So you can do all sorts of rings and changes, which is why the Chinese or other languages more to the east of China can have these tonal languages, which are nothing to do with the consonants. They're to do with, ooh, oh, yeah. You know, going all, changing the frequencies, right, just through basically altering the mouth and the, uh, the, the throat, not so much the lips and the teeth. But I've also uh, been to uh, South Africa where I heard a Zulu man uh, give his guttural gomp. I can't do it. But it, it's a complete sound which sounds like a, a drum going up, gong using the tongue and the teeth. I can't do it. And it's just phenomenal that the sounds that they make, that these tribal languages show the huge variety that you could get. So in, in, in scientific analysis, if you were to actually look at this very carefully and get what we call acoustic uh, patterns from them, you would actually see that the whatever sound is being made is actually producing frequencies like tones on the piano, okay? And any sound that you make is composed of lots and lots of frequencies. So the sounds that I'm making now are not, not okay, it's, it's giving you the English words, at least I hope they are, uh, which are resonating with your ears, and that's a talk in itself, which I've got over there which is the wonder of the human ear, but I'm not doing that at the moment. But the whole thing is just utterly mind-blowing what's going on in your ears as you hear me. But that's, as I say, another talk. In order to present these sounds, they are actually going out as lots of frequencies. At any one point in what I'm just saying now, you are hearing not just 400 cycles per second. You're hearing on top of that 5,000 cycles per second, 5,500 cycles per second at different amplitudes. And that makes the one bit of sound just at that instant. Are you with me? So at any one instant in, in the sound that you're hearing, you're hearing not just one frequency, but what many other layers of frequencies on top. Do you understand me? Some of you will, the engineers particularly may get it. Hopefully, even the musicians might get it because it's many notes, in your terms, all on top of each other. Not just C, but D, E, F, G, and various octaves all put on top. Do you get it? So hopefully I've got the musicians and the engineers understanding me. Different sounds are made by different frequencies put together, right? And linguists, linguists understand this. They have to do a whole course on understanding where the R comes from, how you compose the U and the E, right? And they understand all the frequencies. So the sound is made, this is for the musicians amongst you, so you can understand it a bit more, of many, many different notes, all played together, right? You'd have thought it would sound like noise. Well, of course, in one sense, it is noise. But because your ear hears these sounds and connects them with words, which is a whole different talk, as I said, it actually, the ear splits it back up into the frequencies. 
and you'll have to listen to that talk to see it. Okay, now, so if we're going to deal with English anyway, let's just look at the consonants and the, uh, uh, and the vowels. This is my wife saying the quick sly fox jumped over the lazy brown dog, all the letters of the alphabet in it. The quick sly fox jumped over the lazy brown dog. Okay, so you saw lots of frequencies attached to those words and those letters. So let's look at those individually. I'm going to give you various consonants here. B, K, D, B, G, P, S, T. If you notice, the next to last one, which was the S, in particular goes up to much higher frequencies for a longer time. Now, Colin's in the audience, but I'm going to quote him because he's actually done a lot of work understanding uh, pediatrics and, in particular, child medicine. So with Dr. Slater here, I am trembling in my boots to quote him, but this is what he told me in a private communication which he allowed me to use. And this is very interesting because he has studied the way how children learn. That's the point of this quote. Before the child has learned to talk its mother tongue, all the apparatus, which I've just been talking about, of speech production, not just vocal cord movement, but the cadences and, inton cadences and intonations, rhythms, and beauties of the native language are being practiced before it has learned to talk about voluntarily. I find that amazing. So the baby in the womb actually is listening to its mother primarily, right, obviously, and perhaps its father as well. But you know, in biblically, this is true. You know what happened when the, the Lord Jesus, um, sorry, when Elizabeth visited uh, uh, Mary and uh, the baby let in her womb, John the Baptist, let in the womb because the mother of the Lord Jesus had, sorry, it's the other way around, the mother of the Lord Jesus, Mary, came to visit Elizabeth. Now, that is just incredible. But it demonstrates this point that anybody who says that the, that the, 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 the fetus has sort of, isn't a human being and they justify abortion, needs to take account of these amazing truths scientifically and, of course, biblically. We can prove without a shadow of a doubt from those that instance when Mary and Elizabeth got together that that's a real person who is actually there before he is born. The evolutionist Noam Chomsky, no friend to our position, admitted as a linguist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology he says, too little is known about the beginnings of language he's talking about. Too little is known to justify any far-reaching claims. In other words, the evolutionist doesn't really have a clue as to how language itself came about from grunts or, you know, noises in the trees of apes or whatever. Well... I wanted to give you a little bit of the science. I still need to give you a bit more. Let's just now ask the question, how every voice is unique. We've dealt with how does the voice apparatus work, and I hope you've understood a little bit of that. Now I'm going to actually say to you that each of us has a unique voice. You remember I talked to you about layers of frequencies. Did you understand me that? The engineers would understand the sine waves. The musicians might understand the different notes all playing on top of each other at the same time, right? Okay. Now, when you actually recognize that every voice at any one instant has a number of frequencies going on, which can be split up, then you begin to realize that what's really going on is a set of harmonics which is produced by different, different arrangements of waves which are going across the mouth and going back and forth across the mouth, 
going up and down the larynx. That's really what's going on. How do you actually make these sounds? Well, maybe this little clip will help you to understand. This was from uh, Evan Grant, who did uh, a TED talk way back in 2009. And he, he showed visually what happens when you have different sounds. Climatics expert, uh, John Stuart Reed, and he's kindly recreated for us the Cladney experiment. What we can see here is um, a metal sheet, this time connected to a sound driver and being fed by a frequency generator. And as the frequencies increase, so do the complexities of the patterns that appear on the plate, as you can see for your own eyes. Okay, so now that's going the other way. He's creating a sound, right, artificially, and he's causing a plate to vibrate. And as he went through those different frequencies, the plate was vibrating differently, did you notice, for different frequencies. So that gives, that's going the other way. I'm talking about with the voice, making those sounds by changing the instrument, which isn't a flat plate in my case, it's this thing, it's the voice box, right? Changing the way I'm dealing with the pharynx, changing particularly the way that I'm dealing with my mouth and changing the way my tongue operates. And at every single instant, I get a different sound, which I'm not actually thinking about it. My mind is obviously trained from a youngster to speak English. It's about the only language I can speak. I tried American, but I can't do it, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, Yorkshire, well, just a bit. But, you know, I can't speak another language, okay? But that's the, that's the way I do it. And you do it as well. So we have a unique system. The way Andrew Hilliard speaks to me is different to the way that Peter on the front will speak to me, and certainly different to the way the, the booming voice of Derek Mauler will speak to me. Yeah, what a powerful voice he's got. Wonderful to hear it. So you see, we're all identified by our voices. So did you realize that you've got a unique identity? Now, there's a lot of talk about identity today, but let me show you that every one of you has a unique identity. In fact, the Halifax Building Society and many other banks know full well that you've got a unique identity. So they say, okay, you need to, um, we need to check it's you and you've got to speak into whatever it is that they're recording and they know it's you and it's not somebody trying to impersonate. So let me prove this to you. You know who this is, don't you? I read your, your open letter you wrote the other day Who's and that? I thought it was incredibly moving and very brave of you to write Who is it? Um, down, you know, such personal feelings. Who is I, it? I want to ask you very much. Um, Prince William, of course it is. You found. Prince William. We know it immediately. Well, he's pretty famous. Who's this? By the way, uh, I cannot help but reflect that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British, <coughs> instead of the other way around, I, I might have got here on my own. <laughs> It's the famous speech that Churchill gave to the Senate during the Second World War. And eventually, um, Roosevelt joined the war, as you know. And then, uh, who's this? All these creatures are connected one with the other, either directly or indirectly. And all are ultimately dependent upon them. Yes, it's David Attenborough who's now in his 90s. So he still hasn't understood that God made everything. But there he is commenting on nature, which he loves to do. And how about this? Who's this? Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Who is it? It is the night. Do you not know? Who is it? Alec Jones, of course. It's Alec Jones, and uh, he sang as a choir boy many years ago. And then he sung, sings a beautiful tenor voice um, in his latter years. And he's often on uh, classic FM, isn't he? Okay, now I'm going to come to sing it. And this is where it really shows the uniqueness of human beings. Now, we need to be careful here. Because it's not that nature doesn't have song creatures which sing. But the ability of humans is to join... All that I've been saying about words with 
the voice. Now, this is just truly stunning, right? Now, listen to this. This is one of the best opera singers I've ever heard, and I must admit, it, p people respond to music in different ways, but um, I personally love music. And sometimes music will actually affect me physically, right? I actually have a physical feeling. Not all of you will have it, but we're all different in uh, the way our makeup. But we certainly are both uh, logical people, but we're also emotional people. And if you hear my talk on the ear, that is the last bit of the sound when it goes to the brain. It goes to different sides of the brain, depending whether it's emotive or depending whether it's to do with logic, which is more on the left. Okay, but anyway, I won't go into my talk on hearing just at this moment. I haven't got a lot of time left. Let me now just play you this clip of Rini Martin, uh, Marin, sorry, singing this wonderful um, uh, song. absolutely amazing isn't it just staggeringly beautiful but of course that is secular that's not a, a christian song at all it's a love song you know it's pleading with her father to let her marry the one she wants to marry and that's what most secular songs are about but the, the song is hugely beautiful because it's combining words with music and the best songs of course is when the clarity of the words come across as well as the music. And that's what's unique to human beings. And of course, song um, is, as I said, singing voices uh, will, will split according to whether they're soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And remember I talked about the frequencies of the tone, the, the notes on the piano. So a bass song, right, will involve much lower frequencies Rini, who was just singing there, was using all these frequencies at the top range all together on some of those notes and making a really rounded, beautiful soprano voice. And liquids know this when they're not just dealing with words, but they're dealing now primarily with vowels, which have to be conveyed in the song. And so linguists or people who are training, I shouldn't say linguists really, but those who are training people to sing um, are actually getting them to actually express clearly the words where they have to operate their mouths as well as operate the, the, uh, the lungs and in particular the diaphragm down here. So it's an incredible system that we have and it's all to do with the combination of the larynx, the pharynx, and the voice spot, the lips, the teeth, and everything else is absolutely incredible. So when we get humans singing together, sometimes you can get a unique note or very close to a unique note. Let me play you this from Foray's Requiem in Paradisium. singing this one it's this one it's this one here that's the note you're hearing So you can actually get a, a singer to actually sing something almost as a pure tone. That's what's so remarkable in that piece. But let me now just show you this. This is 
quite incredible. This is, uh, this is the same person singing four different parts and he's put them together, right? And a lot of people were doing this during lockdown in the 18 months when we were in our sheds on our own, not able to you know, meet anybody else in the dark and all the rest of it. What a terrible time it was. But uh, this, is, this, uh, this gentleman is doing all four parts. It's rather lovely to hear it. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. I think that's just utterly wonderful. Because there you've got all the four parts from the same person. And it shows to you that actually we can all, if we're trained carefully, sing all four parts and bring great glory to God. But just coming back to the voice, it's due to this pitch change, which is operated by the larynx, where if it's a lower pitch, it's loosening the chords. And of course, if it's higher pitch, then you're stretching the chords more. That's what's going on in the stringed instrument part of our voices. The wood wind, or I wouldn't say wood, but the wind part, as it were, is all to do with the, the, the operation of the voice box, the pharynx, and the lips, which gives the rest of the sound. If you don't think this is relevant to the gospel, you need to think again, because the Lord himself says this, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, he will save, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with, or thee, with singing. Isn't that lovely? The Lord sings. And we are told to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. I hope, by the way, that, well, our church is just about to start singing. We've been a bit slow doing it, but uh, that's the decision of our church. But, you know, singing is part of worship. And I understand those who've been frustrated during the last times. We have to be cautious about making too strong a statement here. But I have missed it. I will say that much. I really missed singing as the Lord's people. But I do just want to mention one last thing before I close, and that is that, of course, other creatures do sing. The humpback whale does have a song. So when it says in the Psalms about other creatures giving glory to God, particularly in the latter Psalms, Psalm 148, 49, 150, it talks about let all the creatures, let the whole world give glory to God. It's a wonderful ending to the book of Psalms. I really love it. I'm in the Psalms at the moment and I just, I've grown to really love the Psalms. And uh, I think it's, it's something which comes on to most Christians, particularly as they grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole of creation gives glory to God. But you, you don't have words with it. Okay, they are communicating, but it's not the same as communicating with words and the sound, the song together. Every voice is unique, even with penguins. I won't play that anymore, but uh, they communicate by hundreds of thousands of penguins all being together, and yet the adult, which has been away for a long while getting the fish, happens to know exactly where its chick is by the sound that each one of them is making in the midst of a cacophony of all those other birds doing the same. Somehow it knows. I'm going to have to miss that one. Well, all this is coming because... Birds have a different system to us. Now, it's not true of penguins, but the, the passerine birds, and in fact, all birds will have a syrinx, but what's called the passer, passerine birds actually have the ability to use the 
syrinx, which splits the trachea into two to sing two, two notes at once. Did you know that? That's why birds are so beautiful. So this one isn't very beautiful. This is the white bellbird, but it at least does have the ability to make a remarkable sound. It's one of the loudest birds that you get doing this. Got two notes at once. That is what you hear in the South American Amazon. I've never seen them. Quite an amazing bird. But another bird in North America called the common loon, but we would call it the great northern diver. We have them here as well. Makes a most evocative sound as it's going down. Well, this is in a Canadian lake. And that's due to the syrinx, which splits the track here into two. So it's got, can play two notes at once. Hasn't just got one larynx, it's got two larynxes, basically. And some birds, as a result, can sing duets. So one bird's singing one bit, and the other bird's picking it up. I've heard them in Australia when I've been, and they are remarkable birds. Well, I need to finish. I'm going to end on the one voice. Remember I said that every voice is unique? One voice in particular is unique, Amen. and that's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that Lake of Galilee on Mark, in Mark chapter 4? If I tried to say, peace be still to the Lake of Galilee, would it have stopped now? But there's one man who could. Because even the inanimate sea and the wind recognize the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, peace be still. I find that stunning, don't you? And when the Lord Jesus said, get up and walk, immediately the person in Mark 2 got up and walked. And in John chapter 11, when Lazarus, who was dead, came out of the grave, he had to. A dead man had to get up and live and come out of the grave. And that's going to happen as well to us. In John chapter 5, it says all the graves will open when the voice comes of the Lord to do so. John chapter 5, it says, all the graves will open. Let me ask you, if you are not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that John chapter 5 says that there will be a resurrection of damnation for you. If you do believe in the resurrection of the Lord, sorry, if you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who bled and died for you, then it will be a resurrection of life for you. Are you ready? for that voice of God, which will be heard by everybody. All those who've died, and by the way, there's more people alive now than have ever lived before, ever. In other words, if you integrate the population curve in rough terms, the amount of people alive today is more than integrating all the people who've ever lived before. It's incredible. Eight billion has now gone above the people have worked this out. And it's an incredible fact. But God is going to resurrect everybody by his voice. It's a powerful point from the scriptures. And yet that voice was also used to sing a hymn. And even in Matthew 26, when the Lord was in Gethsemane, he prayed. Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And when he cried again, it says on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Such is the power, even of the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross when he finally died in my place. 
that voice was heard in heaven. And it, as a result, God tore the temple curtain from the top to the bottom. I tell you, friends, are you ready for that voice of the Lord Jesus Christ? At the moment, he says, come to me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He calls everyone to himself through the Bible, through his word, through the preaching of very frail preachers like myself, Derek, Stuart, Simon, and others. But ultimately, you're going to hear the voice of God directly. Are you ready for that? You need to turn to the Lord Jesus as your own saviour, lest you be condemned for eternal damnation forever and ever. You know they cry in hell. You know that, don't you? They cry in hell. Their voice, though, is not heard. Remember that story in Luke 16. But go tell my brothers. He said, if they won't believe Moses, they won't believe if someone rose from the dead. Be too late then. You need to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to you spiritually now before it's too late. Thank you.